Thank you very much, Nitya. Uh, Excellent uh, presentation. We have a pretty strong lineup of speakers this morning, wouldn't you agree? Um, uh, and the last one, not the last talk, but the last one in this session is uh, Martin Heglen. Martin is trained as a physical therapist, became involved in football research uh, in the world famous uh, football research uh, group in uh, Linköp, at Linköping University. Finished his PhD in 2007, I think, yeah. uh, on uh, risk factors and epidemiology of football injuries based on the Champions League uh, study mainly, but also uh, one of the few in the world who has actually been involved in more than one intervention study, randomized control trial in, uh, in uh, preventing football injuries, which, which speaks to speaks volumes for his, his, uh, his zest for, for football injury research. Currently an associate professor in the physical therapy department at the in University of Linköping. Uh, the floor is yours, Martin. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Roald, and thank you to Aspetar and the organizing committee for inviting me here for this uh, presentation. Now, this will be a narrative review in a field where there is unfortunately quite limited uh, scientific data. Uh, but I'll start off with looking at the risk factors again, just very briefly. Uh, Matthew and Emery, as stated before in 2007, identified previous injury and low adductive strength as strong risk factors for uh, groin injury. Again, Ryan et al. in 2014 uh, again presented previous injury, weak adductor muscles, and uh, high body mass as prominent risk factors. And I'm sure the nice study by Dr. Whitaker will be here uh, very soon also. Now, if we look at the intervention studies that exist here in, in sports, they have focused on mainly addressing the uh, uh, weak adductor muscles um, and also uh, core, muscle, uh, core, core muscle training. Now, as I stated in the beginning, there's quite uh, limited data here, but there are three studies where they've looked at groin injuries specifically for their interventions. And there are two studies from uh, football, soccer, and one study from ice hockey. And I'm glad to see that representatives of the Danish and the Norwegian research groups are here uh, today at this conference. Now, in the study by Holmick in 2010, they based this prevention program on the well-known uh, groin rehabilitation study in The Lancet in 1999, where they used isometric adduction exercises, uh, core exercises, the folding knife exercise, some uh, uh, neuromuscular and stability exercise, cross-country skiing. Also some concentric and eccentric work with as a partner work that, that can be used on the field. And also based on clinical experience, stretching of the iliopsoas muscle. Uh, they performed a nice cluster randomized controlled trial in uh, amateur football. They trained about two to four uh, sessions per week, male adults. Uh, it's quite a nice sample. Of, just over 900 players here. The injury definition, they included both time loss and medical attention injuries to get a broader picture of the injury problem here. And in total, 53 groin injuries. The intervention was integrated into the warm up to all the football practices during the season. Now, they did find a non significant uh, risk reduction in the intervention group by 31%. But probably due to an underpowered study, this was not significant. Uh, another comment is that the compliance to the exercise was not uh, reported in this study. Now, in the study by Engelbretsen and colleagues, they used uh, some of the same exercises here, a similar program, isometric A deduction exercises, transfer, transverse abdominal exercises, some plyometric work, and also some sliding exercises and the neuromuscular cross-country exercise. And this was also evalu evaluated in a randomized controlled trial, but based on an individual randomization. It was in elite and amateur football in Norway, highest three divisions, and also male adults. Now, they took an interesting approach as they identified 160 high-risk players that have had a previous groin injury or had complaints from the groin, functional complaints from the groin. 
and the randomized they then turn intervention and control group. Uh, they only included time loss injuries in their study, so a total of 27 injuries. They did not find a difference between these two groups, actually a very small increase in the rates in the intervention group, but it was not statistically significant. Now this was a small sample and the compliance to the exercises was very poor. In fact, two thirds of the players did zero intervention exercises. So it's very difficult to draw any conclusions about the preventive effect from this training program. And another comment is that they included only time loss injuries. And we know from many studies that time loss injuries probably only capture the tip of the iceberg as a lot of these players will continue playing on with growing problems. Uh, now the third groin specific study is a ice hockey study by Tyler and colleagues from 2002. They also included mainly adductor strengthening exercises, isometric, concentric and eccentric exercises as exemplified here. And they also had a sport specific training that could be used more similar to, to ice hockey. Now this was a prospective cohort study, it was not randomized. They had two control seasons and then they implemented this intervention and they followed them up for two more seasons. Uh, elite ice hockey, NHL, only one club, 58 players. And they also identified 33 high risk players that had a low adductor strength as compared to abductor strength. They also included time loss and medical attention injuries, but only 11 injuries in this uh, small study. Now, they did find a significant reduction of uh, adductor injuries in the intervention seasons as compared to the two controlled seasons with an odds ratio of 0.16. Now, we have to be aware that this was a non-randomized study. There's no control group. It was quite a small sample and the compliance to the exercises was not reported. Now, we can also draw some conclusions about the prevention of the groin injuries from other prevention studies where they have focused on more broader uh, injury uh, inclusion. And there's four studies that have evaluated the, either the FIFA warm-up program, FIFA 11, or the 11 plus warm-up program. And I'll take you through these four studies as well. Now, I guess all of you are familiar with the 11 program or the FMARC BRICS that was originally evaluated by Jung and colleagues in 2002. 10 exercises with mainly neuromuscular control and also some strengthening of the uh, abdominals and uh, lower limbs. What Jung and colleagues find in a prospective non-randomized intervention trial in youth amateur football in 2002, they included just below 200 players and the injury definition was time loss and uh, medical attention groin injuries. Only 11 injuries included uh, in their data. The intervention was multimodal, so the F mark bricks was only a part of the total intervention. We have to remember that. They did, however, find a significant reduction of groin injuries in their intervention group with an odds ratio of 0.19, so basically 80% uh, risk reduction. Uh, I mentioned the limitations previously. It was not randomized. It was quite a small sample. It was a multimodal intervention, so we don't know whether it's the training or the other interventions that have caused this risk reduction. And also we can question the diagnosis because they had a doctor coming there once a week and some of the minor injuries might have been quite difficult to, to diagnose. Now in a NICE study by Stefan and colleagues in 2008. They had performed a cluster randomized control trial in amateur youth female football with more than 2,000 players. So a very good uh, study with a rigorous design. Uh, they included time loss injuries and they captured in total 20 groin injuries. The intervention was a warm-up program and they had 15 sessions and then one session per week throughout the seasons. They did also find a rate reduction in the intervention group. This was not significant, uh, rate ratio of uh, 0.42. Probably this was a power problem here as well. Few groin injuries, only 20. Uh, low compliance to the intervention, 
50% among the teams and only 15 sessions per player on average. So it's quite difficult to draw any conclusions here. In another study by Van Beestervelt and colleagues, they also performed a test to randomized controlled trial, again in football. This was male adults, two to three trainings per week. They had 456 players, included time loss and medical attention injuries. What they found was also a rate reduction by 25%, but again, not statistically significant. Probably this study was also underpowered, only uh, 48 injuries. Uh, the coach was diagnosed in the injury, so it's not a very secure diagnostic, uh, diagnostic system. Compliance was okay, 73%, or 30 sessions per player on average. Now, the 11 was developed to be the 11 plus, and it was evaluated by Stuhlegaard and colleagues in 2008. And this time they included progression of exercises to increase uh, compliance among the teams. They performed a nice cluster randomized controlled trial, again with almost 2,000 players, again in football, and this time female youth football players. Time loss injuries to the hip and groin were included. And they find equal rates in the intervention and control groups, so no effect from the intervention here. Again, it was quite few hip groin injuries. The compliance was okay, but they included only time loss injuries, so probably just the tip of the iceberg. Now, to try and make a summary of these studies, we can see this forest plot that to the left of the horizontal dotted, sorry, the vertical dotted line, you can see in rate reduction in favor of the intervention group. And to the right, you can see in the rate increase in favor of the control group. And even though the studies cross the line here, the confidence intervals, we can see a tendency that most of them are to the left of the horizontal, sorry, the vertical line meaning that there is probably a, a rate reduction. Now, for those of you who are more interested to see a systematic approach to prevention, I can recommend the study by Ernest Esteve and colleagues, who is presented as an abstract out here in the hall. So finally, to try and summarize, I think we have to move forward in groin injury prevention in a systematic approach. And this is one model to use by Caroline Finch, uh, the TRIP model. Uh, we need to more, know more about modifiable risk factors, uh, perhaps specific to the clinical diagnosis of the clinical entity. And also, I think there's limited evidence on extrinsic risk factors, which I think is probably quite important. Uh, we have to test the efficacy of the preventive exercises or uh, interventions with sufficient samples, RCT design, and so on. And also, I think we have to test the efficacy of the exercises in terms of effect mechanisms. Can we really address the a deductive strength? Can we address the biomechanical properties and so on? Now, the final step, once we find a efficacious preventive intervention, we have to study whether this works on the field, in the real world. So we have to address implementation as well. Is it well adopted? Is it used with high fidelity? Do the coaches and the athletes like this program? And can we see a long-term maintenance of the program over time? So this is my colleagues in the football research group and our funding resources. Thank you very much. <laughs>